just apologise for the slightly delayed um, start. Um, for parents mean no discourtesy, there was to be quite a queue, set of queues actually today outside the court getting in for whatever reason. We had that problem um, this morning and it's obviously itself. So I do I do um, offer that apology Maybe it is um, to the court. Um, uh, my lords and my lady, I had uh, essentially completed uh, my reconfigured submissions um, in the light of helpful interventions and invitations from the court. Um, say, um, in respect of the response that um, I want to give to the question provided by the Master of the Rolls, what extra evidence might there um, be uh, deployed, or might the parents wish to deploy? Um, having had the opportunity, for which I'm grateful over the short journey, to take instructions, uh, we identify um, four areas. Um, the first, we would seek to file a further statement from the parents. It's likely the parents would give um, oral evidence, um, although I don't want at this stage to commit myself um, to that. Uh, as to how Archie is and expanding on Archie's attitudes and beliefs. Um, secondly, we would uh, wish to have some evidence from the Trust as to their ethical decision-making that has in the past been carried out and will be undoubtedly subject to the, view, subject to the determination of this Court carried out um, prior to any um, further hearing if, if there is a remitted hearing, and that would include the consideration of any ethics meeting. Um, third, and this of course was already on the agenda to some extent, the parents would wish to consider making an application for an expert in ethics. You will recall that Dr. Jones is expertise was raised by the parents and was um, that was uh, not acceded to by <coughs> Mrs Justice Abuthnot but that's something that we would like to canvas again and finally uh, we would want to consider making an application for the instruction of an independent clinician um, to opine upon uh, matters of dignity in relation to Archie uh, uh, passing in a natural way. So those at this stage um, are the four areas that we would contemplate seeking to deploy evidence in relation to. Right. That I think is, unless there are any questions from the court about anything that's risen over the course. Sorry about that. That's entirely my fault. My computer sometimes likes to make those noises, even if its sound is turned off. Um, th those are my submissions, my Lord. Unless there are any matters that I have raised that require amplification or clarification. Not for me, Mr. Pitt. No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay, I'm very thank grateful. You. Thank you. Mr. Westgate. My Lord, yes. As we understand that the way that the point's now being put, it, it's in effect on the basis of a, a procedural irregularity or, or unfairness ground in effect that uh, the to put it colloquially that the court took its eye off the ball on the best interest point um, and was uh, deflected um, therefore um, by over consideration on um, the uh, question of whether or not Archie had died uh, and then gave perhaps insufficient consideration um, to the uh, question of best interests. Uh, and we would respectfully suggest that when, when one looks at the, the case overall, uh, both the uh, procedural steps that were taken um, and the way in which the judge addressed the matter, um, then um, it's something which uh, can't really be extracted from, from those documents because it was clear that this was always case. Uh, the best interest Sorry, case. I didn't catch that. It, it's clear that this was what? always a best interest uh, issue uh, because the um, application right from the start was if um, it didn't turn out that Archie was brain stone dead then the question would be um, one for the court um, as to whether treatment should be withdrawn in his best interest. And uh, that, may, it, it is made, 
that focus is maintained throughout the procedural steps and into the judgment. Um, and we would, again, respectfully suggest that um, an indicator of that uh, can be seen from the list of um, additional matters uh, that has just been given to you that the, the um, appellants would want to rely on. And of course, in, in a case of this... Um, Sorry, what, what does that list of additional matters show? Well, I'm, what, I'm what, what, what it shows is that actually best interest, or what it tends to confirm, is that best interest was, was properly um, in focus. Uh, because um, each of them are, and, and again, I, I don't want to take the over-technical or over-procedure about this, but this is an appeal, uh, and we have to um, consider the, the steps that were open to the parties to take at first instance. Um, and the statement from the parents and an application for an independent clinician on dignity would both have been matters that would have been open for them to pursue below, and they didn't. Uh, they did pursue a, an application for an expert ethicist, uh, but that was uh, turned down not because uh, it was something that was uh, not needed because best interest wasn't an issue to be determined. It was turned down because it wouldn't add anything to that determination. So that's uh, not really addressing the fundamental point, is it? Well, the, the, the fundamental point we would suggest is, is did the judge properly um, focus on the fact that this was a, um, a, a, the, 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 the question for her, or the, the question for her, uh, was Archie's best interest and, and withdrawal of treatment? But that, that's not really the, the question. The, que the question is, looked at at the point at which it became apparent that a brain stem test was not possible, was the focus of the hearing and the evidence adduced before the judge distorted uh, by a concentration on the question of death rather than the question of best interests? And, and then the question is, if that is the case, um, whether we can uh, in some way restore <coughs> that balance and evaluate best interests um, at this level without an opportunity for the parties to reconsider what evidence they want to put before the court on that question. And can we properly do that, bearing in mind my Lord's um, now memorable statement that good enough is not good enough? Well, it, it, if we it, it can just about good. get away with it, that's not good enough because this case is all about Archie. No, we we'd certainly accept that, and, and, and in one sense the two questions merge into one for that reason, because okay. if the judge um, ha was deflected in the way that is, is suggested... Or well, I mean, she obviously was, because she dealt with 180 paragraphs about um, death and um, only a very few paragraphs on, on a provisional determination of best interest. If I hadn't determined death, I would have said the best interest lay in stopping treatment, but that was really not a major part of her determination. Well, I'll, I'll come to the judgment in, in a moment, um, right. but what we would say is that on a fair reading of the judgment, she, she clearly does keep best interest in focus throughout, and, and quite a lot of the voluminous paragraphs um, serve both to deal with best interests and the question of death, um, and uh, in particular the medical evidence. I mean, interesting, that perhaps you could help me with this. Does she, apart from at the end, where there's those paragraphs about best interests, um, I, I suppose I can do the exercise myself, I'm just going to search for best interests, well, does she deal with it early on as well? Yes, she does. It, it, perhaps I, I, I was going to end with this, but perhaps I should start with it. Um, and it's, um, uh, if one starts at paragraph um, two of the uh, judgment, uh, she there explains what the application is about, um, and one sees there that uh, she explains at the end of that, if the court is not able to make that finding, the court should consider whether it's lawful and in Archie's best interests to continue to receive the con to continue ventilation. Then uh, one comes on to consider the, the pen portrait of Archie um, following the visit. Um, at paragraphs six 
to 10. Um, and, and that is all background. Obviously, it's, it's the kind of background that one might expect to find in a judgment of this kind. But it's instructive that she took the time to visit him. Um, and she um, included these passages in her judgment, which obviously go um, to, to the strength of the family bond um, and, and are something which um, will be taken into account in, in best interests. Uh, she then deals with the court process um, and a preliminary application uh, before coming on to deal with the uh, chronology and the medical evidence. Um, and, and without going through the medical evidence in, in detail, uh, what she um, what, what that evidence does uh, is as well as uh, pointing towards um, the, the likelihood of death having occurred, um, it, it also um, addresses the extreme um, improbability of any meaningful recovery. Um, and that is dealt with um, repeatedly uh, in the, the medical um, uh, notes that uh, the judge refers refers to. Uh, so, for example, if one goes to 73, Dr. Z, um, well, I, I, you can read it for yourself, but um, at the end of that it says he's very likely to remain in a comatose or vegetative state and dependent on medical, mechanical ventilation for the rest of his life. Um, and 77, without blood flow, the brain could not survive or heal. Um, and so the evidence that um, the judge dealt with wasn't something that only went to the question, the, the, the first question. It also critically went to the best interest question. <coughs> well, the summary that, that I would give is that she, um, she, she did what you said at the beginning about the pen portrait, and then she uh, referred to um, the, the evidence from Miss Carter in some detail. Then she dealt with the law in best interests in some detail. Yes. And then she had her relatively short section of paragraphs 183 as follows, um, saying, although I found <coughs> that Archie died in deference to his parents' views, I go on to consider best uh, interests. But, but that's right, but, but before one gets to that, uh, she also deals in considerable detail with Miss Carter's evidence. No, when I said that. But, but, but in doing so, pa page 97, pa sorry, paragraph 97, she says uh, that uh, Miss Carter provided important information, which I take into account in the anxious consideration I must give to the evidence concerning the declaration of death. She also gives important evidence in relation to the best interests decision. So she, she is clearly aware of, of where the evidence is going, what the evidence goes to. Um, and when one looks at the evidence of Ms. Carter, um, the um, section from paragraph 102 onwards about Archie's Christian beliefs can only be relevant to the best interest question. Um, and so the, the evidence that she recites um, is uh, clearly going to best interest, and it's difficult to see what it's doing there if it's only going to um, the question of uh, whether or not Archie had died. Uh, and, and then she goes on to deal with the arguments, and although it's right to say that she deals in some detail with um, the best interests point, she certainly doesn't do so in any, um, if I can put it, formulaic way, because um, she uh, deals with law and relation to the best interests of par paragraph 161. Um, and then specifically addresses um, a, an important argument that was raised on the part of the parents at paragraph 167, uh, where they raise their, the point, but the point that they make now, in fact, um, that uh, Archie should uh, stay on mechanical ventilation until he dies naturally. Um, and they accept that this could happen in the coming months, weeks and months, um, and then uh, an argument that because he feels no pain doesn't mean his life has no value. Um, and then on this um, issue as well, in, in relation to best interests, uh, the judge also deals um, with, um, and I've So 
sorry, but well, before, before one gets to that, there, there's the uh, reference to uh, the, the Guardian's evidence um, on uh, the, the question of best interest, and that's dealt with at uh, page one, four, paragraph 141. 141. Uh, one, one, And there is also um, a discussion of an argument um, about the uh, whether or not yes, it, it's it's the um, it's the point raised at paragraph one six eight and one six nine um, in relation to um, the question whether um, it can be burdensome or involve the imposition of harm when someone doesn't suffer pain. So it, the, the judge, it, it, it's not simply a case that the judge. Setting out well-known propositions from Aintree and uh, and from uh, Pixler, uh, and, and then going on. And what, what she does is she expressly addresses particular arguments um, that are raised in the particular context of this very anxious case. Um, and she then goes on to deal with her conclusions. And although it's right to say that best interests are, are dealt with in a relatively few paragraphs, they pretty much bear comparison. Um, with the uh, number of or the volume of, of discussion in relation to, to best interest to, to the, the um, brain death issue, so it can't be said that there's some kind of imbalance in, in the way in which she reasoned the issues. Both of the ultimate conclusions are expressed in a fairly concise way. Uh, but uh, the uh, the judge then goes on at one eight three uh, to explain in deference to the parents' views. Which his best interest if she hadn't made that finding. Well, you, you had my submissions from before lunch about why it is that that didn't find its way as an alternative finding into the order, which is that it, it couldn't logically do so. Um, and then one has her consideration of those matters. Now, I, I'm, I'm not deliberate at this stage, given the, the um, reception that Mr. Um, Everett had um, about uh, the uh, going into the detail of, of whether or not this was right or wrong. But I, I'm simply showing you this to show the, the level of consideration that the judge gave to this issue. Uh, and that it's wrong to say that it was in some way sidelined. And in particular, um, at paragraph 193 to 194, uh, the judge set out the um, reference to Archie's treatments. Um, and in the final sentence there, the clinicians are struggling with his weight loss and his fluid intake and output. That puts them at risk of sudden and catastrophic cardiac arrest. And that, that, of course, is what lies behind the Trust's concerns about the urgency of this matter. It's simply not something that was left to wait. Um, and um, if Archie remains on mechanical ventilation, likely outcome for him is a sudden death and prospects of recovery is nil. Uh, and then, um, as final sentence said, the downside of such a hurried death is the inability of his loving and beloved family to say goodbye. Now, again, without getting into the um, a, a discussion about the judge's evaluation there, um, what she is doing um, is expressing a view and discussing what, in essence, um, is, is the, the principal point of issue um, between the parties. Obviously, best interest is, a, is a, a holistic consideration that takes account of the entire domain of the child's best interests. Uh, but, uh, and, and, but without overlooking all of that, the 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 the, 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 the the point at which uh, the trust and, and Archie's parents disagree here um, is whether um, it is in Archie's best interests to um, continue um, on ventilation until um, that outcome happens, um, as the parents put it, a natural death, uh, with all that that entails uh, following a cardiac arrest and attempts to, at CPR and so on. I won't go into the details. Um, or uh, whether there should be a plan to. And, and, that's, and that's what the judge had clearly in mind. Um, and she had recited the evidence in relation to it, she'd gone through the arguments about it, and she addressed the point. Um, and it's, and it's, it can't be maintained that uh, that was in any way something that only arose at the last minute um, or 
uh, was only something which <coughs> um, had been put in at a relatively late stage. Uh, because the, the application, when it was first made, uh, and that I think is in the cool bundle, uh, no. <coughs> yes, it's, it's, it's tab 10 of the cool bundle, page 156. Uh, and uh, at page 161, that made clear even if the results of the test, the bottom of the um, box corner, even if the results of the test indicate that AB's brain stem is still functioning, the applicant considers it would be in his best interest to withdraw ventilation and allow him to die on the basis he won't recover consciousness or ever be able to breathe by himself. Um, and the evidence that was put in, in support of that uh, by I think it's Dr. A. Um, the statement in April, I think 27th of April uh, 2022, which is um, in the main bundle at uh, page 183. I don't ask you to go to it, but what it dealt with um, was the treatment regime that Archie was. Um, undergoing <coughs> uh, the instability of his condition, the risk of cardiac arrest, and so on. All matters that went plainly to best interests rather than uh, whether he had already died, although she expressed the view that that was highly likely. Um, and then the directions that were given, although uh, Mills have rightly pointed out um, that this um, didn't contain a an express set of directions directed to the best interest hearing. Um, nonetheless, it uh, clearly included um, matters that would go to that issue. So if one can go to the order of the uh, 27th of May, which is at uh, Core Bundle uh, 80, page 88, tab 7, uh, one can see there that uh, the, the first and second respondents, the parents, that's paragraph 7, uh, were given uh, permission to rely on evidence from a family member uh, describing the child's and family's religious beliefs, values, wishes, and feelings. So again, all of that goes to best interests. Um, a priest or vicar, again, regarding religious beliefs, values, wishes, and feelings. It, the, the, the family took the opportunity to produce evidence on A and not B, and I note that um, it's not suggested now that that's um, evidence that the family would want to bring in. Um, and then at uh, page, th th then one has um, a paragraph nine, first and second respondents' application permission to rely on the evidence of Professor Jones, medical ethicist, is dismissed. And it was suggested there that Mr. Jones, uh, uh, Professor Jones, was, was going to be um, giving evidence both as to the meaning of death um, and also as to ethical considerations. It's also right to say that uh, paragraph two, uh, the trust was required to serve copies of minutes of a meeting. That was an ethics meeting. Uh, that was, in fact, done. Um, and one finds that that is at uh, page... Uh, 425 of the supplemental bundle tabs 38 to 40. I, I don't take you to it. It's, a, it, it's, it, it's something that principally deals with testing rather than. No, uh, no direction in this order for the Guardian to file a report. No, my lord, that, that's interest. absolutely right. That is absolutely right. Um, and uh, you, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to um, deal with what the Guardian would have said. It's, it, it, but the, no, no. Um, it's just, if, if part of your submission is that this was a proper job uh, with the court fully engaged looking at best interests alongside the other uh, application of declaration, it is noticeable that there was no direction for the Guardian um, to advise the court on in writing on the best interest issue. Uh, I, I certainly, it, it, it's, it may be that that's something that one would normally expect to find. Yes. Um, but that doesn't mean that the point was overlooked by the court. Um, and when the point was raised in the judgment, or, 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 at the final hearing, uh, the judge dealt with it fairly summarily, 
uh, you may have seen um, also in a passage in the uh, judgment of the 13th of May, uh, when uh, the, the, the judge um, expressed the view that this particular guardian was someone who uh, wasn't shy in expressing her views and, and uh, would have done so if she felt that there was anything uh, that hadn't been said, if I can find the reference. Um, she uh, says, That, uh, yes, it's uh, page uh, paragraph, it's page 43 of the core bundle, paragraph 68. Uh, uh, without asking who turns up, she says, I hope the Guardian will forgive me for saying this, but this particular Guardian isn't slow in speaking her mouth. If she had concerns about the proposed testing or indeed the way Archie was being treated, she would have said so. So it's, it's, it's a Guardian who, it's an experienced Guardian who, who, if she had information to bring to the court that. Uh, bore on this, and certainly bore on this in a way which was contrary to the application being made by the Trust, one would have expected it to say so. Uh, but uh, coming back to the um, way in which <coughs> matters proceeded before the final hearing, uh, before, the, uh, before the judge, if I can ask you to look at... Um, Mr. Westgate, is that right? Because the Guardian's concluded view was, or plea, that, that Archie was dead. Uh, and so it's unlikely that, that someone in that position, if they thought of something they might want to say contrary to the trust's view on best interests, would, would raise it because the conclusion of the guardian position was uh, that best interest didn't arise. Well, it's she did um, make representations um, at the point of the final hearing, um, which also went to best interest. So she certainly didn't think that her task was at an end once she herself had concluded right. that that's where the evidence was pointing. Um, <clears throat> and, and of course, she may or may not have been right in that. Um, it, at the point she expressed any view, um, it was before the judge had made her order. Uh, so she would have to work on the basis that well, she, she might be wrong. The, um, so, uh, if I can then come on to um, the position statements that uh, arose before um, the um, final hearing, if I can ask you to go to page 78 of the supplemental bundle, please. And this is the parents' position statement. Um, identifying the issues. This was the uh, directions here on the 25th of May. Um, and they express rather well um, the, in effect, the, the, the central final issue, as it were, um, I, I, uh, w without overlooking the broader, broader... Which paragraph? It's paragraphs um, 11 and 12. Where it says it's understood the trust case with the Archie's conditions turned on treating and encouraging unstable like the deteriorating diet at any moment. Now, at that point, the family's position was that they didn't accept that, uh, although by the time of the judgment they appear to have done so. Um, and if that factual premise is accepted, then the issue of best interest is all about the timing and management of future debt. The choices between, and then it gives uh, the two choices, which in effect are the two points which the judge ends up addressing. Um, and it goes on to say the trust and the guardian advocate option A on the ground of best of, of, of itself. So there doesn't seem to have been any real doubt, the point being made on behalf of the appellants today, that they, they need to know what the guardian's position so they can, so they can counter it. There doesn't really seem to be any doubt that uh, that's what um, the party's respective positions were. And um, while it might be said that the Guardian's position could be more fully expressed. In terms of whether or not the judge had sufficient information, which is the question here, um, and in terms of whether or not this is on the evidence, there is really, sadly, very much else that can be said. That, express, that, that encapsulates uh, a significant part of the point that the judge had to decide. And if one then comes on, I'll... I'll, I'll I've got about four more references and then I'll stop. Um, so um, the 
I, I, I've taken you to the, uh, to the judgment um, and um, it's well you, you've in fact I think seen the uh, position that was taken by the um, parents and the guardian at uh, the hearing so I don't need to take you to those again just whilst we're still yes. in that document um, at paragraph 20 page yes. 79 uh, Mr Quintavalli on behalf of the parents and this is dated 24th of May all evidence must be relevant to the issue of best interest evidence about diagnosing brain cells So he was suggesting to the court that the way of dealing with the matter <coughs> now seems to be sort of common ground should should now be the way forward. In other words, the court should now focus wholly on a best interests analysis and, and uh, approach to the decision making. But that that obviously wasn't taken up, and that's not the way the case. It wasn't, but that, that was because the, the court didn't accede to the argument that's implicit in, in that argument, um, that because brainstem testing had failed on the 16th, uh, therefore that was conclusive as to Archie being alive. Um, and the court then went on to deal with that question, and uh, we accept. But does that not reinforce what Mr. Deverick submits, namely that effectively decision was made, that the focus was going to be on declaration, and that really consideration of best interest became almost incidental. Well, no, because what was being suggested was that it should only um, go on best interest and, and, and not on declaration. Um, what in fact happened was it went on both tracks, because as we've seen, the order um, makes provision for evidence that goes to best interest and to, and, and the, the idea that because a court um, produces an order which deals with two issues, um, one must dominate the other um, to, to the extent that uh, the court errs in law um, in consideration of the other issue. Uh, can't we suggest be sustained? Um, and um, there are, then if I um, take you briefly to the uh, position statements of the um, Trust that uh, there's on, on the 6th of uh, June, page 99, tab 15. This is really for completeness. Um, 99 of the no, 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 sorry, no, that's that's the guard, that's the, the guardian. I'm sorry, it's the uh, it's page 130. Supplement. I am sorry, it's the next one, it's page 152, which is the closing position, final hearing. Um, and uh, it's pa paragraph 11 and 12. And again, it's, it's succinct, uh, but it, it addresses the What we would suggest is the core issue, uh, and and all the other points about that the trust can give meaningful evidence about about the Archie's medical condition that had already been dealt with, uh, as as I attempted to show, taking you through the judgment. Would you bear with me? One, uh, what, what I um, what I haven't done um, is um, gone through um, what is um, in our skeleton argument in relation to the trying to uphold the judge's reasoning on best interests. Um, taking my cue from uh, that not being uh, something the court wanted to travel into. Of course, if the court were to decide not to remit this, uh, then we would suggest that it would be appropriate to hear argument on that. But um, I, I confine myself to what was before the court and whether it was whether, whether there's substance in the point, however it's put, um, that uh, the court didn't properly 
address best interests? Well, I think you should address that point because we may find uh, that you're right and that you shouldn't be remitted and we're not going to come back for another hearing. Uh, no, it, it's it, the, the, the reason I, I, I hadn't done it was I, I, the, the, the Mr. Uh, Mr. Devereux has got his, um, his, his arguments again, the, 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 the way these arguments arise is they're part of the appeal. Um, and, and I'm happy to respond to the appeal. Before I mean, we appeal take it as read. Put. If you said we should determine it, you would say the judge was right. Yes. Obviously. Well, uh, well I, I think having um, taken you through what I have taken you through, I, I probably don't have a great deal to add to what I've got in, in the skeleton argument. Can I just look at my, my note on the point? Uh, particularly as, as you haven't been asked to, or you, you haven't been uh, uh, taken to anything um, else which um, is provided in addition to um, the uh, appellant's arguments, but, but if I can just um, recap um, where the judge was on, on the medical evidence, uh, and, and unlike the uh, declaration point, there doesn't appear to be any real issue about the facts, if it was assumed that Archie was still alive, which is that he was unresponsive, and that is completely unresponsive, no evidence of any brain stem activity at all. I, I make that point not in relation to whether or not he's alive or dead, but the, the, the point that it's there's an absence of any reflex responses, any recognition, any capacity to um, to, 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 to experience um, the outside world in any way. No hope of any meaningful recovery. Uh, the highest estimate of any witness was Dr. Jed, who put it at less than 1%, uh, and then recovery to PBS. Um, and his position was unstable and hard to maintain, uh, with a cardiac arrest that could happen literally at any minute. Um, and the evidence on the 6th of June there, I think, have been two crash teams. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly the time frame, but, but it, it shows the, uh, the, the, the critical state that he's in. Um, he's losing weight, and he's subject to a, a, an intrusive regime um, and is subject to infection risk. Uh, and so it, it's something that can only get worse, and it's never going to be substantial. So, so that was the, the medical picture. Um, and the judge, uh, we suggest, uh, properly took into account Archie's previous wish to be kept on, on life support. Um, I, I don't um, uh, say any more than we've said in, in relation to the uh, skeleton argument on that. Um, I, um, it, it was um, it, it, the, the, the point that is made on behalf of the appellants it, it is that given our AG, Archie's age and maturity, uh, it's something that uh, should be given considerable weight. And of course, um, uh, someone of that age should have their wishes and feelings taken into account and given um, very careful thought. But, but it's fair to say that um, apart from one um, account of uh, an extremely touching comment from Archie about uh, what, what he would like to happen to him, um, there's, there's no indication that he was considering or even aware of um, the, the, the reality of the situation he's in now. So the judge is entirely right to say to observe that his life is, is fundamentally different uh, from what uh, he previous experienced and what he could have um, anticipated. Uh, so far as the um, RCPH guidelines point is concerned, um, the uh, I, I'm not going to take up time asking you to go to it, uh, but I would draw your attention to the, uh, the Parfit decision, which is in uh, page 676 of the um, authorities bundle. Definition of burden not limited to that in the code. Indeed, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the Mr. Justice Poole expressly used the language of burden in, in this, his first instance judgment. And it's also, um, and again, all these cases turn on their own facts, and so there's little to be gained by comparing the facts of one case and another. But when one looks at page 676 um, and the uh, circumstances that uh, Pippa in that case was in, um, they, we suggest, um, are ones where I I if that was a burden, um, then, then so here. Um, and um, so far as the sanctity of life point is concerned, the, the argument doesn't appear to be that the judge wasn't aware of or didn't take account of sanctity of life. The argument appears to be that um, she took into account generic factors um, weighing against it. Uh, and we respect it, just there's nothing in that. Uh, because very often um, factors will apply to a great many cases. Um, but they're still dealt with on an individual basis, and that is particularly the case here, uh, because um, in, in relation to uh, Archie's wishes and feelings, um, 
but of course, very many people who end up um, on life support don't envisage exactly what the circumstances will be, but there are degrees of foresight. Um, and um, the fact that Archie is unaware of, of his mother presence, um, again, has particular poignancy in this case, given the way in which he expressed his wishes and feelings. So it can't be said it's simply a generic factor that applies to everyone. And, and likewise, the risk of sudden death. It, of course, that's always a risk. Um, but again, there are degrees of how soon that's likely to happen, what the consequences will be, um, and the circumstances of the intervention and so forth. Uh, and those are matters which the judge took into account here, specifically in relation to the uh, So I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to take up any more time adding to what we said in our closing arguments unless there's any point you'd, you'd like me to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. Miss Scholar. I want to be careful in what I say because there is a prospect of a further hearing and there is a prospect of the same guardian being involved in, in that hearing. Whether it's right that it should be the same guardian is perhaps something that will be canvassed. I'd make it absolutely clear that the guardian would be very willing to assist further if that would be welcome to all concerned, particularly the parents. And of course, if there is anything that she can and should do, for example, to visit again, speak to the parents again, and that would be welcome on their part, she will of course do that. She bears in mind that it may not be welcome on their part and she doesn't want to intrude if an intrusion, if it is an intrusion, is unwelcome. The other reason I want to be careful is because insofar as I make submissions that may give the impression that she has prejudged an issue or has a closed mind in relation to the best interests analysis, that would be wrong. Um, she is an experienced guardian and she is capable of doing the type of mental gymnastics that judges go, do, go through. This is, is my position, but if I'm wrong about that, this is what I think on a different view. And that is what I would suggest she did when she provided, through me, her analysis to the court. The word distortion has been mentioned and there has been a sense that perhaps the judge's decision was wrong because it was incompletely informed by a greater analysis that the Guardian could have provided had she been asked to provide a second report going exclusively to best interests <coughs> or had she been asked to step into the witness box and assist in that regard. Had she done so, she would, I suspect, have drawn the court's attention to that which I, I think this judge already had in mind and that would be the welfare checklist in section one of the Children Act and in those regards of particular importance would be the ascertainable wishes and feelings of the child concerned section one through a physical emotional and educational needs at B likely effect of any change in circumstances at C and at E, any harm which he has suffered or is at risk of suffering. One of the reasons why I say I think the court can be confident that this judge had those matters in mind, even they don't appear in her judgment, is because one of the things that happened in the course of submissions was that her attention was drawn specifically to the case of Rakib and she went away and read Rakib and I think refers to it in her judgment. And I wondered if I might ask you to look um, briefly at a particular paragraph there. It's in the authorities bundle and it's page 497 at paragraph 119. Um, it's number 16 on the list. That's the tab number. No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Um, it's page 497. Let me which, which paragraph? That's paragraph 118. 116. Okay.
evidence that was determined in Rakib um, in relation to best interests was whether the court should look into the future when determining a child's best interests or rather evaluate best interests at the point that the decision falls to be made. That's about four lines down. And it was put on behalf of the parents that the court should look only at the point, at best interests at the point at which the decision falls to be made. And the judge went on to disagree and said that might be the position under the Mental Capacity Act, but the Children Act provides expressly for consideration of risk of future harm when determining a child's best interests. And he went on at the end of that paragraph to say that under Section 13E of the Act, those would include areas of physical deterioration that are covered in the medical evidence when best interests are being considered. She doesn't, although she undoubtedly it's a, a very substantial judgment. She, she went away to read it, she went away to read it. But she doesn't refer to this. She, do. she doesn't refer to the checklist in the children. No. She so doesn't. this submission that you make this afternoon is is what? We must assume that the judge uh, was aware of these matters. Lord, yes. It, it would be surprising had she not done. And she doesn't reference the Act or Section 1.3 or the Welfare Checklist, but a large portion of the um, earlier parts of the judgment, particularly the medical evidence that went to condition and to prognosis, was relevant to the Welfare Checklist. Well, it's not a promising start, Scotland, is it, to make submissions about the the robustness of the judge's welfare evaluation by inviting the court not to see what she said but to assume that she must have taken account of matters. It, it would have been better if she had made reference to the welfare checklist and perhaps looked at things under the subheadings of the welfare checklist. And it's the point made by Mr Justice McDonald that paragraph 119 is really important. No reason to doubt the validity of what he says. That when you're making a decision of this nature, you don't just look at how Archie is today, and, and no parent would, would do that. You take account of known knowns as to what it is likely to be uh, in terms of his situation in a month's time, or two months' time, and what will befall him if uh, the treatment is continued, but uh, as the doctors predict, or that he will. So that's a perfectly proper thing, but it's quite a sophisticated thing to take account of. And uh, uh, it may be, but I don't think the judge travels down that road in her judgment, does she? I think what I'm trying to say is that although she hasn't analysed it in terms of the checklist, the substance of the facts about condition and prognosis that she set out in her <coughs> decision were relevant to the welfare checklist, suggested by my lord that perhaps she'd gone, she, she'd taken her eye off the balls, I think the metaphor that was used, and that therefore that that part of her long judgment that was devoted to encapsulating the medical evidence might have been looking and rather pointed exclusively to the determination of death ball rather than the best interest ball. It, it, in my submission, it was relevant to both, and it was highly pertinent 
best interests. What I said on the Guardian's behalf in the position statements was concise, but I hope that it wasn't incomplete. It has been put to you by Mr Devereaux as it was put to Mrs Justice Arbuthnot by Ms Leonard Jr. that there is a binary choice in terms of best interests between, on the one hand, a natural death when the heart stops beating, which would be the parent's preference, and on the other, what is referred to as a choreographed death, um, choreographed by the doctors. That was not how it really appeared to the Guardian, and I tried to encapsulate that in her position's statement. Sorry, I didn't catch that reference. Um, that is the 6th of June, um, at page 106 of the supplementary bundle, at paragraph 21. Archie's point of view, 
trying to take into account the Article 8 rights of those nearest and dearest to him, but with his welfare being paramount, she did not feel that further mechanical ventilation was in his best interest. There was nothing that she could glean from going to visit Archie a second time because his condition had not improved. So that would simply be a, a visit that could be conceived of as unwelcome and intrusive to no good purpose. She was aware, she having visited in early May, that the judge went to visit Archie on the afternoon of the 27th of May and had therefore seen him some weeks on. The lady asked um, whether the case management and the evidence got distorted again um, because Mr. Quintavalli had made the submission that the focus now should put death to one side and look at best interests. In fact, when you look at the parent's physician statement 48 hours later on the 26th, he was talking about the evidence that he would wish to adduce in relation to best interests, which was from an ethicist. But after that, Ms. Carter went on to provide a further third witness statement on the 1st of June, and the Guardian took that into account when she provided her physician statement for the 6th and the 8th of June. So she didn't stop taking things into account or say, my, my, my role here is fulfilled. I've reached a, a, my view on whether Archie is probably dead or not. I now stop looking at any further evidence. She not only continued to take into account new evidence, but she continued to attend court and listen to the evidence. statement um, with the paragraphs that we've just looked at was provided um, I think we were all working under some pressure of time um, probably on the, on, on the date of the 6th of June um, everybody had a lot to deal with but her position was known in advance <coughs> she was there I know it is very unusual for a guardian not to give evidence um, it remains the fact that nobody did express the view that they didn't understand her analysis or that they wished to test it or they wished to ask her some questions about how she had arrived at the position that she set out in her position statement and there was advanced notice of what she was thinking and those reasons as to why she had arrived at that position. So from a procedural point of view, that opportunity was there. But without wishing to sound in any way critical, which I am not, I was a little surprised to hear that if there were to be a remitted hearing, the parents would wish to give evidence. My recollection is that they were there for a whole or at least part of the final hearing, and my understanding was that they had not wished to give evidence and that Miss Carter was put forward as the person who was best placed to speak on their behalf. That seemed to the Guardian very understandable. And if I may say so, um, without wishing to sound in any way patronising or um, personal, Miss Carter was an impressive, very measured um, and very thoughtful witness. One could well see why she made an excellent advocate on Archie's behalf. In relation to a remitted hearing and ethical decision-making expert evidence, that would be, um, I think, perhaps unknown generally to the court in terms of making decisions. And if this were to be a best interest analysis, it would be very much um, of the type that judges are required to do very frequently in which they are trained and well able to do. We would not be in the uncharted waters of making a declaration of death on a balance of probabilities or a difficult standard of proof that might require some ethical tension to be resolved by way of expert evidence. I am not convinced that hearing any more evidence from the Trust about what had happened at their ethics committee, 
who attended, what was discussed, whether it was a properly constituted committee and so on, would have taken the matter any further forward. We have an abundance of authorities that say that where there is a dispute between parents and doctors about the best choice for a child in terms of medical treatment, the hospital is required to bring the matter to court. Guard says that, um, Rakib says that, many other authorities say that, and the trust had no choice but to bring the matter before the court and did so properly. The fact that they may have had, I, I'm not in a position to say, but perhaps an indifferently arrived at ethical committee decision before they made the application is neither here nor there. The important point is that they made the application. And the fourth point, instruction of an independent commission to opine on dignity and passing in a natural way, um, that really, I think, probably falls under the rubric of ethics of some type and expert evidence, and I would repeat the submissions that I've made in relation to um, any kind of ethics expert. I can see that one wouldn't have started from here I can see that one would have wished for a judgment that referred to the Children Act and Section 1.3. However, I do feel that the judge was shown all the authorities that she needed to see, and that the medical evidence was, in, in some people term it a magnetic factor or compelling, but it was. And then friend Mr. Deverex has made um, reference to a balance sheet, burdens and benefits table. Um, the Lords and the Ladies will be aware of the authority that tells us that benefits and burdens are not to be mathematically weighed and the difficulty of the balance sheet approach is that it doesn't necessarily indicate where weight lies. The Guardian's position statement I hope did that by saying that she felt that the medical matters, condition and prognosis um, between now and however the heart stops beating uh, were a matter to which she gave very significant weight and therefore it's not, I would suggest, apparent that a benefits and burdens table would have assisted in best interest analysis or helped the judge in any way to weight the factors properly. I do consider, and so did the Guardian, that a remittance of the hearing, I can see why procedurally that would be the gold standard. But it isn't required. It will add to the time. Um, and Archie's condition is unstable. And in the Guardian submission, you have all the information that you need to make a dis further decision if you need feel that one is required. Otherwise, the Guardian feels that the judge got it right, albeit there could have been an expression of reference to the statute and the welfare checklist, but the welfare checklist is there, um, just under different headings. And that adds one minute. As I can assist you further. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Deverex. In matters of life and death, the gold standard should be reached. What we've heard this afternoon from the Guardian is that she took into account all relevant factors, including the cardinal principle of the sanctity of life. But how did the parents, I ask somewhat rhetorically, know specifically what factors she did in fact take into account? How did they know what weight she gave to those particular factors? And how would they have been able to challenge the factors or the weight that she supposedly gave to them? They couldn't on the written documentation and evidence that was provided to them and to the court. It's not with the greatest deference to this court for this court to make or to reappraise or to determine 
what is in Archie's best interests. Of course, as the Master of the Rolls has emphasised, Archie is the heart of all of this. But this court is not a court of fact. If it were to do so, it would deprive the parents the right to explore and challenge any of the evidence that it alights upon. This court does not have the transcripts. This court has not heard the oral evidence of the individuals who gave evidence. And it doesn't have any appropriate and detailed assessment of the factors and the weight given to relevant factors by, by the Guardian. And this court would be left in a position of trying to put together bits of a jigsaw with the most extraordinary consequences where there are very many pieces missing. And on behalf of the parents, we simply say that in matters of life and death, the interests of Archie and Archie's right to a fair trial demands something very different. What should happen is that this matter should be remitted and an effective, appropriate, fair and comprehensive determination of his best interest should take place. Thank you very much. We'll rise for five minutes.
reasons that we will give in due course in writing, um, we have decided to announce our decision now uh, because of the urgency of the matter. Our decision is that the appeal will be allowed and the case will be remitted to a judge at first instance to hear the question of the best interests of Archie. Uh, that hearing will take place on the 11th of July, 2022, before Mr. Justice Hayden. The time estimate will be one day, subject to the judge himself deciding that he needs more time. Uh, we propose now to decide uh, three questions, if anybody wants to say any more about them. First, the question of whether there should be a new guardian appointed in advance of that hearing. Secondly, the question of whether there should be um, experts, either in ethics or in natural death, um, because that will need to be got on with at a pretty uh, fast speed if there are to be such experts. So Mr. Deverex will hear uh, from you first and then from other counsel on those three points. Um, I, I've got a note of two points, whether there is, needs to be a new guardian and 
experts. Two, two, two experts. Two experts. <laughs> two experts. <laughs> Thank you. Next three. Um, in relation to uh, point number two and three experts, I have to say that I have not come equipped. Uh, well, you've said what you've said. Um, to, I wasn't really envisaging to, you wanted to say to more. Deal with that. Um, and presumably you haven't got, and this isn't too critical, the name of any expert you want to Well, we have uh, Dr. Jones. Of course, of course, yes. Um, yeah. I would feel uncomfortable um, making the uh, appropriate representations on the experts now. To, mm. about to say well, you, you have no yeah. choice on Dr. Jones because that decision was made. It, you've appealed, uh, and we made a case management decision that it would be listed for PTA with A to follow uh, today. We can, well, we can hear your submission on that appeal. Um, well, uh, then I will um, uh, roll up my sleeves uh, in yeah. relation to that. Well, we um, have got, we've got what you have to say. Um, have you had an opportunity, uh, my lady and my lords, to look at his expertise? Yes. Um, there is his um, CV contained within the bundle somewhere. I can't immediately recall quite where it is. Um, and you would have seen uh, the skeleton argument that dealt with um, that particular uh, point. Um, is contained within the core bundle at um, page Forgive me, it's at the back of our skeleton argument because we, we combine big yeah. Um, so at the back of our skeleton argument, we, we provide um, the reason why we sought to instruct Dr. Jones, who's an eminent um, expert in the yes. field of ethics. Um, and so we rely on those observations um, uh, contained there. And um, the court may take the view that given... Uh, what the court uh, may regard as the deficiency in the best interests assessment or uh, determination that the parents should be given the opportunity to deploy evidence that they regard as um, looking, looking at your skeleton which deals with this um, the points made in, in favour of um, or your challenges the judge should have granted permission. A, issues of medical ethics are relevant to the substantive determination of the legal meaning of death and the issue of the accommodation of arduous religious views. B, determination of death is an evaluative one which is informed by medical ethics and moral policy. C, in matters of life and death, the family should be given every reasonable opportunity to present their case. So that's largely, apart from A, B, C, to do with the definition and determination and declaration about death. Well, to some extent, I accept that. Um, but uh, to some extent I don't and obviously number C um, is um, a matter of importance given where we've reached in where unhappily we've reached in these proceedings that's to say that the focus was lost by the judge an appeal has now been allowed um, the parents in a matter of this gravity should be given uh, some latitude within uh, an appropriate Confine to put the best evidence before the court to make out their case on best interests. Now, I, I, I pick up, without um, going more than that, that there may be a reluctance to go down this route. But well, I mean, one, one, enormous, an enormous sympathy for what you have just said, but there does have to be the basis of a good reason uh, for this to add to the judge's information the judge has to come to um, the quality of decision you described before we adjourned, effective, um, comprehensive, fair, etc. But what is it that a, 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 an expert in ethics would bring to the it best? It provides, does, doesn't it, I would submit, does it not uh, 
um, fit in to that uh, holistic definition of best interest that is included in Aintree, so that it's welfare in the widest possible way. And we say that um, informing the court um, from an ethical uh, perspective with an expert of this distinction provides information that feeds into that uh, particular point. Well, uh, I don't, uh, no Mr. Justice Hayden has all of the great experience and humanity that is well known to this court and to all practitioners who practice before him. But that, in my submission, is not a good enough argument on the particular facts of this case to say, well, this judge is a very experienced yeah, and, yeah. Um, and humane and clever. Yeah, and, that, and it shouldn't. Uh, he, I accept all of those things, and, and, and um, I've, I've made that point to this court before, and I've made it with great sincerity and mm. all the rest of it. But this is a particular case that raises something of particular importance, and we say that um, ethics is part of it. And although there is a reluctance, I understand, there is a reluctance in these sorts of cases um, to... <coughs> go down uh, rabbit holes and cul-de-sacs. This is a case where we say that um, such an expert should be uh, identified and uh, instructed. We've, we've got a name, we've got the expertise, uh, and we, we, we do invite the court to, to permit the parents that opportunity. What about the other expert in the Guardian? The, the other expert, of course, I, I, I don't have um, a, a name. I don't therefore have the expertise. Um, and so, to some extent, my hand is um, tied in relation to that. But we do say that the, the question that the court is faced, albeit a narrow question, is a question of significant substance, and that a independent clinician uh, instructed by the parents will be able to provide the uh, court with evidence as to the important aspect of dignity going forward. And on one view, there is an inequality of, of art. And let me explain that. Again and again, and I, I make no criticism, but again and again, the trust has provided, um, often without notice, um, evidence, not jointly instructed evidence, but evidence from clinicians. They did it to this court, indeed. And they've done it on many occasions to the first instance. And that evidence has simply been permitted. I understand why. And that has happened again and again. Uh, and yet, the parents might perceive that on the, the rare occasion that they identify an expert, uh, it's not permitted. And they, there is an imbalance, potentially, um, in relation to that. I understood that Dr. X was the second opinion at the request of the family, and that Dr. Schumann was instructed by the family. Uh, so Dr. So who Dr. <coughs> um, let me just get my cipher. Uh, Dr. Schumann uh, was permitted, yeah. but remember that was relatively late in the day. Um, and Dr. X. Um, I can't recall from... Second uh, opinion is request says, of the family. Um, is on, this, on the... Well, uh, uh, yes, it's on the, it's on the, um, uh, on the list. And, and so I accept that. But I also note from the list the, the range of other experts, the other uh, clinicians who were simply introduced but, by 
I mean, I, I, mean I, I just want to understand this because my understanding is that the way the clinicians that are treating these heart issues, you would expect the trust to be trial evidence and you'd be complaining if they didn't. Because you'd I would. To have I would. And also, uh, any trust faced with this situation, even before families are struggling either with their relationship with the trust or to come to terms with what's happened to their child, yes. um, the trust in question is going to be getting second opinions, just simply as a matter of course, uh, in, in their, their clinical treatment of a, a child that finds themselves in this position. And so a, a list of these are conventional second opinions provide, obtained by the trust routinely, and again, you would expect them to file that evidence. I don't I'm, not, I'm not seeing why this is suddenly unfair. I'm, be, I'm being opaque. Let me try and be a bit more illuminating. Then. I'm not suggesting in any way uh, that the trust were not appropriate in A, providing evidence from their clinicians, and B, taking second opinions from other hospitals. We see that they did do that. What I'm suggesting is that there is an appearance that simply the weight the repeated introduction of statements from, for example, the same experts is somehow leading to uh, an inequality of arms. So up updating clinicians, updating witness statements, updating the court and the family as I to the current I'm medical condition of the I'm child not, I'm is not, unfair. I, I'm interrupting you, and that's discourteous. I didn't mean to. Um, I'm not suggesting that, that is unfair. If permission is given, well, there's notice, but what has happened in this case is that there has been simply repeated introductions of uh, statements, as indeed came before um, this court at the uh, <coughs> start of uh, the proceedings with which uh, this constitution is engaged. And on the one hand, of course, uh, there should be updating uh, evidence, like other evidence, carefully prescribed and admitted in accordance with rules of court. But what shouldn't happen on the other side of the coin is simply the trust is given carte blanche, a blank check, whichever way you want to put it, to introduce uh, repeated statements, and the family are not. So now, Ms Carter on each occasion had permission to give and a direction to file a new statement? But my lady, I have to go to the, um, the, the orders. I, I can't, I'm afraid... Um, can't remember that, but I, I make my point, uh, and, and um, I, I fully acknowledge all of the uh, the wisdom and, and, and the experience that your ladyship has, and I, and I acknowledge that. Um, ca can I um, come to the uh, the guardian point, please? Um, we, we do say uh, that, that a, a new guardian would be appropriate, given the challenges that we have made to uh, the analysis and the. Uh, progress of the guardians throughout this case. And, and I don't need to repeat myself of this. I've made those well, I think the way Ms. Gold put the submission that was very properly and fairly done was that the guardian makes herself available, uh, provided that that was acceptable yes. to, the, to the parents. And, she was and, 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 it wasn't. and the court have taken on board our position. It, it's difficult. So, so we need to know your position. Your position is that you would like a new guardian. Yes. Um, but uh, that's uh, what we need to know, and it, it seemed, from what Miss Gollum was saying earlier, that, that if that's the position, then a new guardian would be accepted by the old guardian. So it uh, wouldn't only hear the trust further. on that point. W without going, well, I, I don't want to go further if I don't need to go further. I don't think you do need to Thank go you. further, Mr. Debrakes. Um, I don't, wouldn't want the ancillary matters to take longer than the actual substantive. No, nor would I. Okay, let me hear Mr. Westgate. Got it. Yes, uh, on, on the Guardian, it's perhaps something that the Trust doesn't have a, a position on. Um, if I can deal with the um, the, the, the dignity in, in dying expert first. Um, briefly, Mr. Westgate. Very briefly. Um, the, I, I, I don't need to get into the facts about the argument about evidence being put in and not put in. About, I'm, I'm told there were two occasions when we put in evidence without. The first was the when the brainstem uh, testing couldn't be performed to explain what had happened, and, and then last week to explain why the appeal was urgent. Uh, but but in any event, there's a a, a disconnect between a, a complaint about evidence being put in that may be late or is difficult to deal with, uh, and that then being a reason for the family to be able to put in um, an expert.
expert of, of completely indeterminate scope. Well, it hasn't really been explained how it's going to have any bearing. Um, I, I, I perhaps don't need to make that point any more fully than that. Uh, it will, uh, and I won't. Um, and I'll, I'll, the, 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 the next point is the um, ethics expert, um, which, uh, and it has to be remembered that this point is an appeal. Um, I, I, I don't want to be too technical about it, but the fact is that this was something that was considered by the judge um, at a time when uh, whatever uh, the court may um, say in its judgment about the um, balance between um, the declaration and the best interest point, uh, this was squarely being put um, in part um, on the uh, meaning of death point, and as, as was put in an argument, um, it was being suggested that the determination uh, or, or that the family should be given every opportunity to present ethical issues surrounding um, the, the, the withdrawal of treatment. Um, and um, permission was then refused. Um, the, uh, what's being sought is exactly the same application. Um, and uh, the, the judge, having made a, a, we would say, legitimate case management decision, which this court shouldn't interfere. Uh, so, so just uh, in terms of the, the, the way in which this application should be approached, um, it is not simply this court making its own mind up about whether no, it should be an no, 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 appeal. Uh, but even if it was the court making its own mind up, um, it, it still shouldn't allow this again for, for substantially the same reason that, that ethics, uh, first of all, it hasn't really been explained um, what um, this expert would, would bring to the issue of, of best interests. And one can easily understand um, how it would have had a bearing on the, on the death question. Um, I if the, the meaning of death were to be a, a live issue. Um, but that's not a live issue. So what, um, what does this report bring? And you still don't have an answer to that. Um, and in general terms, um, it's not about um, referring to the expertise of this judge or that judge. Uh, the fact is that ethics, as they bear on this intensely difficult area, um, are matters within the province of this court, or matters within the province of the courts, uh, and, and it would be um, unnecessary and undesirable uh, to open that up um, to competing ethical experts um, who, who argue particular, we, we, we don't know where that argument would lead, uh, but, but it's not something um, that the court needs expert opinion on uh, because it's a matter where, where the court applies its own judgment. So that, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gollum, you don't want to add anything to this debate? Um, my Lord, I don't. I misspoke earlier and got Archie's name wrong, and I would like to apologise well, for that. <coughs> for that. Uh, Mr. Deborah Eggs, anything in reply on that? Um, no, thank you. So, thank you for that argument on these ancillary matters. Um, we intend to uh, reflect the ancillary matters in our written judgments, but for the party's information, uh, we have decided that there should be a new guardian instructed for the renewed hearing, uh, but that the appeal against the refusal to allow an ethics expert should be dismissed, and the application for an expert in natural death is also Uh, we hadn't given PTA, so I'm not about dismissing the appeal. I'm simply not giving you PTA uh, permission to appeal. Forgive me. I don't want to use abbreviations that the family don't understand. We're very bad at that. Um, so we won't be giving permission to appeal on that point. Uh, now, there's just a couple of other matters I do need to mention. Uh, first, we would urge the parties to try and secure a very early directions hearing before Mr. Justice Aidan possible this week, um, so that uh, he is seized of the matter and knows the scale of the, uh, the scale of his task. Um, and we will uh, try to provide you uh, with our written reasons for our decision to allow the appeal in advance of that hearing. We can't guarantee to do it earlier, but we'll certainly try. Um, and there's been a request uh, by Mr. Farmer of the press, I think, to know whether he can refer to extracts from the skeleton arguments. 
um, in his uh, press coverage. Um, I think probably, uh, despite our direction that that shouldn't be done, that actually has already been done by some others. Uh, what we're trying to avoid for all the press's information is lengthy extracts from the skeleton arguments um, uh, by way of uh, factual commentary, but some short reference to what's in the skeleton argument to explain what's happened in the hearing is not in the book. That's very kind, and I'm sorry to disturb you. I would just put your mind at rest. Part of the confusion <coughs> was that I've had an email from the press office that they just knew about, but no other journalists here seem to be aware. I think they had, actually, but I mean, that may be something we need to look into, Mr. Farmer, but thank All you. that had happened is that I had written something before I had the email. But, but that's been altered now, and, and what was referred to has been taken out. Thank you. It, it wasn't anything, I don't think you'd be concerned about, just a couple of quotes from, from no, uh, Zebra. We don't want you to feel that you'd been singled out for special attention, because you certainly hadn't intentionally. Uh, no, no, I wasn't. I just, I just wanted <laughs> to be clear. That it was, okay. But thank you for being with Well, can I um, then, uh, have you anything else you want I've to say? I've got one last <coughs> Yes. I, um, <coughs> If I may, um, on the assumption that we are where we could have been on the, say, the middle of May, can I take it that the court would endorse that the then declarations made as to Archie's treatment should revert to what it was then, rather than how it seems to have moved um, uh, to today? So at, at the moment, we've got the judge's declaration at the end of the hearing, which uh, authorises the removal of, of the treatment, but that's been stayed pending the appeal. You want to ascertain what the new baseline is to yes. take matters forward over the next week or so. Exactly. And what I suggest, I've I, I not been very helpful in the way that I've explained it, but in fact, it's exactly what I'm getting at. Um, when we came before Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot, on, um, well, uh, uh, cutting through it, I'm, I'm sure the Lord and my lady would agree that it ought to go back to the position that it was immediately before the final yes. hearing. Yes, but that's helpful. I, I can't think that the other parties could take a different and, and it would be useful if the parties could reflect that in an order. Yes. <coughs> uh, so that it's clear what's happened as of today, even though you won't be able to draw an order based on our judgments until our judgments. Um, can I um, then just turn and check with the, my team whether there's anything else that I need yes. to raise? Um, no, no, thank you. Thank you very much. No, well, it just remains uh, for me to thank um, all counsel and solicitors. We're very conscious that uh, uh, lawyers have been acting pro bono in this case and have assisted the court with tremendous assiduousness and care and we appreciate that. We have benefited hugely from your arguments, from your um, courtesy and also from the dedication that you've shown in working we know late hours and coming to this very expedited hearing. I would also like to thank the family for um, their remarkable um, behaviour in court and their ability to sit through what has been a harrowing hearing for all of us and I'm sure for them. But um, uh, it's, um, these cases have to take place and they are difficult, uh, but it needs to be understood that they're difficult for everybody 